Recently, you may have heard murmurings in the horror game community regarding a certain subgenre that's very near and dear to our hearts. Survival horror is back. People are crying out. Look at these mainstream remakes reviving this long dead genre. To those people, I say, dead genre. The spirit of survival horror has been alive and well in the indie game community for years, and some of the best survival horror games in the last decade have been from small indie talent. So what better time than now to show off some survival horror and survival horror adjacent games that I discovered on my most recent Itch.io deep dive. Let's start off with a nice easy one. Pathogen X is an upcoming survival horror action game that follows in the footsteps of late 90s Capcom titles. A company named Delta Corp Labs has been attempting to cure the world's deadliest virus, and just as they were about to reach a breakthrough, communications went silent. While the game will have a story mode, the demo only features the arcade mode. Your job as Special Agent Hawk is to infiltrate the lab, retrieve the vaccine, and escape before the place is blown to pieces. The mode has very clear parallels to Dino Crisis's Operation Wipeout and Resident Evil's hunk scenarios, where you try to achieve your objective as quickly and as perfectly as possible. You're assessed based on how many enemies you kill, items you pick up, damage you take, and of course, how quickly you can clear the level. Each time, the map is randomly generated, although there are only a limited number of room types that you can encounter. You start with a very limited number of supplies, with a pistol guaranteed to appear in the starting room, but all of the other items in the game are randomized, meaning if you're unlucky, you might be stuck with it for a few rooms. You can find other weapons such as shotguns and machine guns, and bosses drop either a desert eagle or rocket launcher when killed. The gameplay is really fun. The over-the-shoulder shooting makes it very easy to run around enemies and blow them away, while dodging any others that might be coming from your blind spots. The environments also look great. It perfectly fits the survival horror look, and a lot of it is interactable. You can shoot lockers for items, blow up computers and servers, and there's even hidden statues in each room that give you extra points. If you've been following this series, you might recognize is Goji from Hypnagogia, another one of the devs' games that I've covered in the past. Soda Raptor is making some incredible stuff, and I'm very excited to see what else they put out. Hell, even while writing the script, I've been taking breaks to do a quick run here and there. By your second or third attempt, you'll probably be able to beat the game in about six minutes, making it the perfect time killer. While I imagine the main story mode will be a bit harder than this, you can still see aspects of classic survival horror poking through the arcade mode. You have a limited inventory with only eight slots. You have to manage your resources and not waste your ammo before hitting a big encounter, and running away is always an option. Speaking of enemies, while there are only three in the game currently, I really like the design so far. You get a better look at them on the fake box art that accompanies the itch page, but I love the red tentacles coming out of their heads, and the amount of spray that comes off them when you shoot them. All in all, while it is only the one game mode right now, I have high hopes for this one, and I'd love to revisit it when it's eventually complete. When it comes to classic survival horror games, Heartworm has been on my watch list for a while now, and recently the game received its second demo. The game follows Sam, a young girl who finds herself in an internet rabbit hole and reads the story of a house that is said to have a link to the afterlife. After scouring chat rooms and talking to people who have heard the legend, she eventually discovers the location of the house and decides to visit it. The one catch is that no one who has visited the house has ever returned, but Sam isn't deterred. Her obsession with the loss of her loved one and her quest for answers are never explicitly explained, only implied with the ominous line, I just can't keep going on not knowing. With a suitably spooky setup, it's very clear that Heartworm is leaning more towards psychological horror than gory combat. From the moment you take control, you'll notice how amazing the game looks. The fixed camera angles and environments give it an incredibly nostalgic feeling, and the music is beautifully melancholic. The game oozes appreciation for classic survival horror, everything from the door opening animations, the inventory screen, even a save room with its own beautiful theme. But I want to make it very clear that it's not just a load of references cobbled together. It very much stands on its own two feet. Once you make it inside the house, you're free to explore and find the fabled room that connects to the other side. But there are hints that show the house may not be as empty as it looks from the outside. After solving your first puzzle and being treated to some amazing camera angles, you find yourself in an otherworldly location with stairs suspended in the void, folding in on themselves and leading nowhere. After after attempting to return to where you came from, a monster appears and chases Sam back down to the previously locked door, which she has to force her way through to escape. 
Now firmly not in her world, Sam finds herself enthralled by the glowing static of a CRT TV, before the monster appears yet again behind her and she's taken further into the world. From here, the game opens up and we get a clearer view of what the full game will be like. Sam is now in a long street with multiple houses, and while it might look relatively normal at a glance, it becomes quite clear that something strange is happening. Static monsters roam the area, slowing you down with their attacks and chasing after you. The street is bookended by a huge wall of static, and there's even a gigantic spider just outside the map waiting for its opportunity to strike. Your primary mechanic for dealing with the enemies is your camera, which when equipped, switches to a more modern over-the-shoulder view that lets you aim more accurately. While I personally love the game's tank controls and traditional camera angles, I'm completely fine with the combat being a little more modern. Rather than just having the game snap your weapon towards a target like classic survival horror, you actually have to aim your camera and follow the enemies as they teleport away after each successful hit. Your primary goal in the demo is to unlock the door to the house you appear outside of, and to do so you have to locate tree riddles that are scattered throughout the map. By the looks of things, this street acts as your hub world, as one of the houses leads to a much bigger area that I imagine will be fleshed out in the full release. There are tons of little things that I'd love to talk more about, but I'd rather leave some of them for you to discover yourself. If anything I've said has piqued your interest, I highly recommend giving the demo a shot. It's only about an hour long if you really soak it all in, and it's 100% worth it. I cannot wait to see what the full game has in store. Switching gears a bit to a different style of survival horror, The Night of the Scissors takes a few notes from the genre classic Clock Tower and combines it with the camp of 80 slasher movies. The game begins with Adam and his friend Kevin deciding to break into an abandoned post office to see if there's anything worth selling. While Adam goes inside and Kev is keeping watch, you begin your search, only to hear the shutter dropping behind you and trapping you inside. As you look for another way out of the building, you'll start to notice that someone may be inhabiting the post office, and they may not be overly friendly. Creepy text scrawled on the walls and body parts strewn all over the place, on top of newspaper clippings discussing a rash of disappearances, and one article about someone called The Snipper, who people claim is still at large. Unfortunately for our protagonist, the reports are correct, and The Snipper has taken up residence in this abandoned building. With no other option but to press on, Adam is forced to sneak his way through the halls, solving puzzles and avoiding the deranged serial killer. The setup is remarkably simple, and while it is very silly, it's actually one of the scarier games on this list. Adam wasn't prepared for the situation, so he doesn't have any weapons to defend himself with. All he can do to escape the wrath of the snipper is turn his flashlight off and hide in bathroom stalls and open lockers. The 3D audio of the snipper walking by your field of view and the sound of his weapon moving from ear to ear is genuinely incredible and really makes the hiding sections feel tense. If you're spotted, there's very little chance of you getting away, but the game is extremely friendly with checkpoints, which means you won't be set too far back if you accidentally cross his path. The post office is relatively big, and the puzzles will have you travelling from one end to the other fairly frequently. Once you get to a certain point, the snipper will start roaming the halls looking for you constantly, which means you'll have to be very aware of your hiding spots at all times. While I enjoy the fixed camera, there's an option that allows you to switch to a more regular over-the-shoulder option if that's more your thing. While it is relatively short, it's a style of indie horror game that I'm very fond of. It feels very puppet combo. It's very cheap and relatively short, so I won't say much more. Do you think you can escape the wrath of the snipper and lead Adam to safety, or will he suffer the same fate as many before him? Endoparasitic might be one of the most intriguing games I've played in a long time. While at first glance it might look like something you'd play on a school computer and flash player, there's a lot more going on here. You play as a scientist who had been experimenting on a recently discovered parasite in the far reaches of space. Unfortunately for him, an outbreak has occurred causing the entire facility to go into lockdown. To make matters worse, monsters have appeared and ripped off every single one of his limbs except his right arm, with his wounds cauterized by a stray iron and his 
his mind slowly being taken over by a parasite, it's your job to direct him around the facility and attempt to save his research. Being one-handed influences everything you do in the game, and to replicate this, the game is controlled entirely with the mouse. You drag yourself along the floor with left click, you interact with items and files with right click, and your mouse wheel opens and closes the menu. While you may be looking at this and wondering what it's doing in a survival horror video, it all becomes very clear once you get your first weapon. In order to defend themselves from the roaming monsters, the protagonist Synth finds a number of weapons scattered throughout the facility. You've got a revolver, shotgun, flare gun, and crossbow, and your resources are very limited. You start off with exactly six inventory slots, enough to fit six spare bullets for your revolver, but as you explore, you'll find upgrades that allow you to carry more and more. Each weapon type has different ammo that takes up a different amount of storage space, so you have to decide if it's worth carrying one shotgun shell or four revolver rounds. Speaking of ammo though, you have to manually reload your gun each time. That means taking the gun off your back, opening your inventory, removing the spent casings, and then loading each bullet individually. In the case of the revolver, you also have to consider where you load the bullets, because if you're in a rush and put them in the wrong spot, you can find yourself having to shoot a few blanks to get the bullet into the right position, or if you have a moment of peace, you can manually spin the chamber from your inventory. I adore this system, and it's what takes the game from fun flash game to extremely tense survival horror. Not only do you have to consider how much ammo you have at any given time, you also have to consider how you'll find the time to reload your gun. This process makes normally easy situations extremely stressful, and means every combat encounter has to be carefully considered. You can't even hold your gun and move at the same time, meaning you have to quickly fumble for your gun when an enemy appears. The only weapon that doesn't follow these rules is the crossbow, as the bolts exist outside of your inventory, but that weapon has its own unique reload system, where you have to wind the crossbow back and then drop the bolt in before you can fire it, which balances out the lack of wasted inventory space with a much longer reload time. If that all wasn't enough, you also have the issue of the parasite slowly infesting his brain. Your health is constantly dropping in this game, and since there's no way to fully cure it, your only option is to inject vaccines that set its progress back. Like everything else, you have to manually drag the syringe through the menu towards the parasite to heal, and opening the inventory doesn't pause the game, meaning you're vulnerable the whole time. I could write an entire essay on this inventory screen alone, how it combines the attaché case from RE4 with the incredible difficulty of flash games, but I suppose I should talk a little about the gameplay. The actual minute to minute gameplay isn't too hard. You drag yourself through rooms full of enemies, dealing with them so you can solve puzzles, and advance to the next level. Each area will have things like lockboxes full of ammo or healing items, computer terminals full of story details, and a few different enemy types. The big guys have a lot of health, the little headcrab things die in one hit, but move Move incredibly fast from your blind spot, the big skeletons only attack if you move too fast, and there are a few unique boss enemies too. Your vision is very limited, with your draw distance for most of the game being extremely short. Often enemies will trigger from outside of view, meaning you're better off dragging yourself slowly and carefully. If I had to give you some advice, don't try to rush your way through this game. It's deceptively long, sitting at around 3-4 to four hours, and it's incredibly hard. If you try to play it all in one sitting, I promise you'll get frustrated and start making mistakes. My first time getting to the final boss, I was running so low on resources that it was near impossible for me to beat, and all of the items I wasted three rooms previously came back to haunt me. With a very interesting setup that influences almost every aspect of the gameplay, Endoparasitic is an incredibly hard survival horror that's as tense as it is rewarding. For this last section, I'm going to do something I don't normally do and talk about two games by the same creator. Warkus is a developer that I'm a huge fan of. They make primarily PSX inspired games, and I've chosen two to talk about today that both fit into our survival horror theme. The first is a game called House of Necrosis, an RPG dungeon crawler roguelike heavily inspired by Resident Evil. Fair warning, this game is only currently in demo form, and if you want to play the most up to date version, it's available on the absolutely stellar haunted PS1 Spectrum. Mall demo disc. The original Game Jam version is still available on the game's Itch.io page, however the game has improved drastically since then. The premise is a very clear parody of Resident Evil 1. A special forces team was sent to investigate bizarre murders in the forest, they go missing, another team is sent in to see what happened to them, and they end up in a mansion. You know the drill by now. While the demo only lets you play as Amanda, she's joined by a character named Colonel, and they decide to split up and search the mansion for clues. You go floor to floor, moving tile by tile, collecting items, 
dispatching enemies, gaining XP, and searching for the door that leads you further down. The original jam version was incredibly hard. Enemies did tons of damage, items dropped away less frequently, and it was extremely RNG based. If you didn't find upgrades for your weapons or enough ammo, you were basically screwed. The newer demo is a complete overhaul. Not only does the game just look better, there are tons of new items and mechanics to work with. There are items that feel very at home in the roguelike genre, with trinkets that permanently boost your character as long as you keep them in your inventory, and it also added a lot of mechanics from traditional survival horror games, like the gunpowder crafting from RE3 and the typical green, blue, and red herbs from Classic Resi. There's also way more enemy types, and they no longer feel extremely overpowered. In the jam version, the crawling zombie could do 6 damage per hit, but now their damage is a lot more reasonable. Enemies also have movement speeds now, with lower levels having zombies that only move at half your speed, allowing you to get away and position yourself in a more favourable spot. The one thing I will say, with the idea that this is only the early stages of the game in mind, I found the game to be quite easy. While you have a limited inventory, it's actually quite easy to build up enough herbs and ammo that you never really feel threatened, and while the final boss did clear me out on my first run, I had so many items the next time that I managed to beat it pretty easily. It's also got that roguelike RNG, where you could get incredibly lucky and find amazing drops that invalidate the rest of your combat encounters. For example, there are serums that you have to use to discover what they do, unless you find an almanac that reveals them without you taking a risk. On my first run, the first four I picked up were all negative, draining my XP, strength, and dealing damage. But in my second run, the first three or four I got all boosted my XP and strength, which allowed me to one-shot almost every enemy on the floor. Of course, like I said, this is a vertical slice, and I imagine a lot of these balancing issues will be ironed out as development continues. I feel like this is a perfect blend of survival horror and RPG mechanics. Remember, survival horror's roots lie in games like Sweet Home, so it only makes sense that it would work. If you're looking to try something a little bit different, I highly recommend trying out the demo and keeping an eye on this game's development. The second Warcus game that I'll be talking about is a much more traditional survival horror game. Shadow Over Normoth is a classic survival horror homage, dripping in cosmic terror. The game begins with our protagonist washed up on the shore of the seaside town of Normoth. With nothing to their name, they venture inwards to find an abandoned lighthouse and few signs of life. While a lot of the games on this list have been inspired by Resident Evil, Normoth definitely leans closer to Silent Hill, with the dark foggy town and mysterious story. Arguably the biggest giveaway of its influence is when you find your first weapon, and equip it to see him take the patented Harry Mason stance. After exploring a bit, you'll find your way into the lighthouse, only to discover the lighthouse keeper lying dead in a chair, with a gun in his hand. Although, you're only guessing he's the lighthouse keeper, because he doesn't look or sound human. Now equipped with a handgun and a key, you venture further into town, only to be stopped by one of the greatest boss fights in survival horror history, the Sentinel of the Veiled Truth. This giant crab wearing jeans grabs you with its pincers and eventually wears you down, transferring you to dark streets more suited to the genre. From here, the game becomes more traditional. You find a flashlight and use it to explore the town, fight monsters that come at you from the darkness, and solve puzzles. There's very little outright story in Normoth, but clearly something is simmering underneath. All of the item descriptions have a sort of melancholy to them, and there are secret items scattered around the world that relate to our protagonist's past. As you discover more and more about what happens to the people of Normoth, it's hard not to question what relation our character has to the town. As far as gameplay goes, it's exactly what you'd expect. You have tank controls, a pistol, and eventually a shotgun. The point where the game differs slightly to its ancestors is that the melee axe is actually a terrible combat weapon, and is instead used for breaking down boxes and finding items in hidden passageways. The other place it differs majorly is in the boss fights. While survival horror games do have boss fights, there's a specific boss halfway through Normoth that feels more at home in Castlevania than Silent Hill. They're all relatively fun, although they aren't particularly difficult. The intro for the second boss in particular is very cool. The game should take less than 30 minutes your first time through, so I don't want to spoil much more. The ending sequence is worth reaching. Both the final boss and final area offer up a lot of questions about the world of Normoth. Questions you may not like the answers to. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed this itch.io deep dive. As always, the games I've talked about are in the description, so please support them if any of them caught your eye. If you want to support me, my coffee link and other socials are in the description, and please subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you real soon.